<clears throat> All right, so this evening's sermon is going to be actually very similar to this morning's sermon. It's kind of a continuation. It's not exactly a continuation. It's a, it's a, it's a separate path, but a similar concept. So this morning we preached on basically sins that you could commit with the, with the language that you use, the, the, the words that you speak with, and um, we really went into detail on that. And this evening, what we're going to be covering is the meaning of words and mostly kind of how words change meaning over time and how we have to be careful, especially when studying the Bible, to get everything in context that we could understand the meaning um, very clearly and just be aware that we are using a text that was translated into English in the 1600s, the early 1600s. So the language then... Although it's not foreign, it's, I believe, very easily understood. There are some changes that have been made over time, and there are some uses of words today that are not exactly the same as they were when the Bible was written. However, that being said, this is not to cast doubt on God's Word, because you shouldn't have doubt. I believe everything, every word that's a little bit different, you can you could understand and get the meaning of it from the context of the way that it's used. And I'm going to bring up some specific examples today. But the words that we use in general, as I mentioned this morning, you know, words can be very powerful. We saw that this morning. Words carry meaning. And when we're communicating with people, and especially I'm going to be focusing mostly just on biblical conversations, when you're talking to someone about your faith and the things that you believe, that we ought to be very clear about what we believe and just not have any doubt, try to stay away from ambiguous words, words where you're not quite sure exactly what that means or, or, or even spiritual terms that, well, this way you could use it, you know, it, it, it means one thing and this way it means another thing and without giving a full explanation of what you're talking about. See, a lot of churches these days will do that. They'll, they'll post up in their statement of faith these these ambiguous terms, especially in regards to salvation, they'll say, well, we believe you need to repent and believe the gospel to be saved. Well, that's what Jesus said too, but what do you mean by repent? And actually, that's the first uh, point we're going to get into tonight. We started off here in Genesis chapter number 6, and this is the first mention of a f any form of the word repent. You know, repent, repents, repenteth, repented. In Genesis chapter 6, we see the first time. Now, there's a pseudo-doctrine out there. There's, there's a, a, a pretty good rule of thumb to use when you come across a word and you don't understand what it means. If you go to the first time that that, that word is used in the Bible, you will come across a pretty good definition for the word. Usually. Now, this is, not, this is not like doctrine. This is not something that you can just take to the bank every single time, that it's definitely going to be like that. But in general, when there's a more complicated word, you go to the first time it's used, you'll find uh, the context and be able to understand what it's talking about. And this is what we have here. But the context should always trump the first time a word is used. Because there are words whose meaning can alter depending on the context in which it is used. The meanings aren't drastically different, right? The, the meanings can, are just small variations of how it's being used in appropriation with the, with the text that it's found in. But here's an example. Now, when you, if you were to look up the word repent, and I did, and I forgot to put the definition, the current definition in, in my notes. Most people, when you say the word repent, they'll say it means to turn from sin or to be sorry for your sins. That's the definition that people have in their mind. However, sin has nothing to do with the word repent in and of itself. It depends on the context it's being used. But the word has come to be used in that way for so many years that that has made its way into the dictionary as a, as a prominent spot of the definition for the word. Because whatever people understand the meaning of a word to be is the definition of the word, right? I mean, we start using words over and over again. Even if that's not the way they were originally used, over time they could change if that's just what has become the accepted definition of a word. 
that's how people are using it, that's what they're meaning when they're saying it, then that's what it becomes. And we need to be careful about this when studying the Bible. As I mentioned, you know, 400 years old, uh, the English that's being used. Now, here's the first mention in Genesis chapter 6. Look at verse number 5 of repent. The Bible says, And God saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now, right off the bat, we see that the first time the word repents being used, God is the one repenting. He's saying, it repenteth me that I've made man. And in this context and in this usage, it means he's, he's sorry that he ever made man to begin with. And he's, it says he's grieved at his heart. Now, just because, and I'm going to prove this to you, just because in this instance, in this first instance, and this is where you get in trouble with these little axioms, these, well, the first time it's mentioned, that's the definition of the word. No. You, you should get a very good understanding, which this is a proper usage of the word repent. God was sorry, it grieved him that he had made man, and he kind of, he just wished he didn't made him at all. So now he's going to destroy him. That's the way that the word is used here. And that is a proper usage of the word, but that's not the only usage of the word. So the grief and the sorrow does not always have to be a part of repent, however it is in this mention. Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 32, just in the next chapter. And we see that God's the one repenting, so obviously it can't have anything to do with sin because God's not a sinner. God's not sorry for his sins. God's not sorry that he, he committed the sin of creating man on the earth. That's not a sin. God didn't sin at all. God is without sin. He's holy. We, we believe in a holy God. God does not sin. So just the, right there, the, inherently in repent, the word sin has nothing to do with the definition. But we're going to see another usage very shortly after Genesis chapter 6 and Exodus 32. Look at verse number 9. For God repents again. But I'm going to challenge you to see, I don't believe there is any grief in this usage of repent. There's no sorrow in what we're going to see here. We're going to see some anger and some wrath and showing some mercy, but I don't think there's any grief in here. Look at verse number 9 of Exodus 32. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. So God is getting fed up, right? He's um, had it up to here with the children of Israel. Moses has led them out, and they've been complaining, they've been murmuring, they've been lacking in faith, and God's just like, you know what? I'm done with this. Moses, let me alone. I'm going to make a great nation out of thee, because the promises would still stand through Moses. But I'm going to wipe out all these people because I've had it with them. That's what he's saying here. Look at verse number 11. There's no grief there. He's angry. He has wrath. Verse 11, And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. So Moses is pleading for the people. He's saying, God, look, don't do this. Turn from that fierce wrath that you have against them. Because why should the heathen say that the only reason you brought them out of Egypt was to kill them in the wilderness? That's what he said. He said That's what the word on the street's going to be. That's what everyone's going to say is that you really just wanted these people dead. And that's why you did it. And he's just trying to plead and convince God not to kill all the people. Verse 13, he goes on, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now again, that word evil, it doesn't mean sin. Evil means you're going to bring harm 
to somebody. That's what evil literally means. It's a definition of the word. And that's, that's another example of a word that's not even in my notes. It's another example of a word that's kind of changed meaning over time. We think of something that's evil to just automatically be sinful, which is not true because the Lord does evil to people. And we see that here. The Lord is, was going to bring evil on them because he was going to inflict harm. He was going to kill them. That is what evil is. It's what's bringing harm or damage or death to somebody. But does it make it sinful? It would be like the executioner, right? If someone is obeying, even let's just say the law of the land, if someone is guilty of a crime that they receive the death penalty of, the person that literally goes and either injects them with, a, you know, with an IV or straps them in an electric chair and turns the power on or whatever method is used to put that person to death, if it's a firing squad, a person that shoots a gun, that person has brought evil upon the other person. But they didn't sin. They were just carrying out the sentence. Right? They're not murdering them, but they have killed them. There's another good example of words that have changed meaning. When the Bible says, Thou shalt not kill... It's talking about murdering someone in the context. It's not automatically just if you take another person's life. So uh, the context, you'll see, is key with everything. Uh, you know, in the Bible especially, but in everything. I mean, when you, when you read anything, you need to understand the context. You can't look at and what's real popular today, even on, on Facebook and, and the social media and stuff. On YouTube, you'll get small clips of, of things. You'll get small clips of, the, of a police interaction with somebody. You'll get small clips of things, but you don't get the broader picture. And, when, and you don't get the context of the situation. And oftentimes you'll see one thing, you'll be like, oh man, I can't believe that happened. That's horrible. You know, we're going to be all up in arms about this. But then when you understand every, all the details that happened, it's like, okay, now I can understand how it got to this point and how this small snapshot of events took place. We gotta be careful never to rush to judgment. Then this is a little bit on the sidestep for from what we're talking about here with our words, but on seeing small things, because those small clips are designed to manipulate people. That's it, it's propaganda. Most of them, not all of them. I mean, sometimes there's problems and you don't get all the footage, but and this is all you can get. And you can pretty much see enough of the context to get an idea of what's going on. But oftentimes you'll have small clips of things where you don't see the whole thing. And we need to be examining the Bible and using the context to understand the definitions of things, to know that, that evil isn't always sinful. Now, many times it is sinful. When you commit sin against someone else by, by hurting them, by killing them, by doing whatever, you, know, you are bringing evil against them. You could also be sinning. But just the fact that we see God here ready to do evil does not automatically make that a sin and the fact that God repented. And the reason why we turn here to Exodus 32, we just see God was mad. God was going to kill him. Moses interceded and asked him to, to, to spare them. And God listened. He hearkened unto Moses' voice. He listened to what he had to say and he changed his mind, which is what the word repent means. He rethought it. Literally, repent is, is means to think again. He thought about it again and he changed his mind. And which is the same thing he had changed his mind in Genesis chapter 6 about having made man. He changed his mind about it after the fact, after he had already done it. What we see in Exodus 32, he changed his mind before he had done it. In Genesis chapter 6, we see a grief and a sorrow after the fact. In Exodus 32, we don't see the grief and the sorrow. We just see that he changed his mind on what he was going to do. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. This is an important definition that we need to make sure that we have down very clear in our minds. Because there is false doctrine out there that teaches a works-based salvation that says you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. In Mark chapter 1, because people say, well, wait a minute, Jesus said to repent. Jesus said you need to repent in order to be saved. And they'll return to, they'll turn to places which I agree. That sometimes the word repent is used in the context of salvation. Absolutely. 
But does it automatically mean that sin is involved and being sorry for sin is involved in, that word, in the usage of the word in that context? Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 14. We're going to see the Bible reads, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So what's he doing? He's preaching the gospel, right? Verse 15, and saying. So the Bible says he's preaching the gospel and this is what he was saying. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So that's the way he was preaching the gospel. He says, repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, is sin mentioned anywhere in that sentence? Because I didn't see it. Does he say anything about being sorry for your sins, to turn from a wicked life, to stop doing the bad things, and to do the good things? No. We didn't see that in Exodus 32 either, because the word repent doesn't inherently have anything to do with sin. What he says here is repent. You need to change your mind. You need to change. Repent ye. You need to change your mind. And then what? And what, what, what am I changing my mind to? And believe the gospel. Who's he preaching to? He's preaching to the lost. He's preaching to people who don't believe the gospel. He's preaching to people whose faith is not in the Lord. And he's saying, repent. Whatever their faith is in, whether it's in themselves, in their own good works, in a false god, in some idol, whatever their faith is in, they all need to repent and to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, yeah, is that necessary for salvation? Absolutely. Because prior to believing the gospel, you have your own thoughts and your own beliefs on what's necessary for salvation. You need to change those beliefs and put them on Christ. That is the repentance that's necessary. We see this spelled out because John was put into prison in Mark 1. If you jump up to verse number 4, the Bible says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So here we see again, John the Baptist preached on repentance for the remission of sins, for your sins to be forgiven. Again, another context of repent being used for salvation. We saw Jesus doing it in Mark 1.15, and we see John in Mark 1.4 both preaching on repentance for salvation. Well, in Acts chapter 19, the Apostle Paul tells us exactly what John the Baptist was saying when he was preaching on repentance for the remission of sins. Acts 19 verse 4, the Bible reads, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. The exact same phrase that we saw in Mark chapter 1. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people. So this is what he was saying when he was preaching the baptism of repentance, saying that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. The repentance that John was preaching was belief on Jesus Christ. And that not, he doesn't say anything about their sinful, wicked life and how they have to be sorry for it and so sorry, God, that I'm willing to change my life and to just live for you. I'm so sick of my sins that I'm just going to live for you. That's a false repentance for salvation. The repentance that's required to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're sorry about your sins, does that make you unsaved? No. It's a good thing to be sorrowful and to repent of your sins. Those are good things to do. But repenting of your sins is not what saves you at all. It's not a part of the process. If at the moment that you hear about Christ and you hear about your sins and you just all of a sudden become sorry and, and convicted and, and you feel real grieved over the things that you've done at the moment that you decide to accept Christ, nothing wrong with that. I'm not preaching against that, what I'm preaching against, though, is this false idea that the word repent inherently has something to do with sin automatically, or that it even inherently has something to do with grief. You don't necessarily have to be sad in order to repent. Because repentance is a change of your mind. It's a change of what you believe. You're believing on Christ for your salvation. Jonah chapter 3 
explains that anybody that turns from their wicked ways, turns from their sins, repents of their wickedness, is doing work. It's a work. And it's defined in the Bible as being works. So if you do not believe that salvation is by works, then how could you stand there and tell me that you believe that you must repent of your sins to be saved? Turn, if you would, to Jonah chapter 3. It's at the end of the chapter. We're going to read verses 8, 9, and 10. And if you don't have this marked, if you don't have this memorized, a very good place to reference when you're out soul winning with people who just swear up and down that you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. I've shown this to people, they don't have an answer. Because they'll, they'll see it because it's black and white what it says. Jonah chapter 3. Because if we're going to use, if we're going to let the Bible define itself and define the terms, let's let it use, let's, let's use it to define repentance. Let's use it to define all these terms that we're going to use, especially the spiritual ones. I mean, repent is a very spiritual term that we're using here because it's, it's involved in salvation. We see God doing it. It's involved in, in, in many places throughout the Bible. The word is used quite often. So what is it talking about? Well, we can't just go up with a word like this when it's used slightly differently according to its context. You can't just go to one place and just say that this is automatically what the word repent means because of this one place. But it essentially means the same thing. I mean, it, you see different aspects being brought in at different times. And I'll, and I'll say this about the grief thing. More often than not, there is grief associated with the word repent. There is some sorrow there. It is probably the more common usage of the word, but I'm just trying to explain that that's not always, it does not always have to be the case. It does not always have to be a part of the definition of the word repent. Jonah 3, look at verse number 8. The Bible reads, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. So here we're going to see sorrow. Because they had just heard the preaching of Jonah against the city of Nineveh. And they actually believed what he was saying, and they were getting really real sorry about all that they had done, all the wickedness. But let, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. So what are they doing? They hear it, and they're saying, we're going to turn from our evil way. We're going to turn from that violence, from, from the wickedness that we were doing. We're going to turn from that. We're going to stop do and turning from that wicked way, what does that mean? They're stopping doing it. They're not going to do it anymore. Verse number nine, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Again, another example of the word repent. He said, turn and repent and turn away. So what's he doing? He's turning, right? doesn't say that God is sorry. I'm sure God's not sorry that he's going, you know, for not wiping out the people. Like, oh man, I really wish I'd wipe them out and just kill them all. When the Bible says the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He brings forth its, his judgment when it needs to be brought forth. When people need to be judged, he'll do it. But it's not like that's what he really wants to do. It's not like he really wants to destroy a whole people. So if he were to repent here when they're saying maybe God will repent and he'll turn away from this fierce anger that he has. Maybe he'll be appeased. Maybe we could satisfy his anger a little bit that he won't be quite as angry now that he sees that we've changed our direction, that we've changed our actions, that we've changed from committing all of this wickedness. Maybe he won't be as hard on us. Verse 10, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. They turned from their sin. They turned from their wickedness. They turned from their evil way of doing violence unto other people. They turned from that. They stopped doing that. And the Bible calls that works. God saw their works that they turned from their evil. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Perfect example of people who were sorry for their sins. They were sorry for what they had done. They repented. They turned from that sin. And God spared them physically 
It doesn't say that their souls got saved and are going to heaven now. God just physically spared the nation from destruction. But the Bible calls that works. Very important definition to make sure that we understand that we have that straight. Because people are, are flippantly using that terminology, I repent of my sins, you got to repent of your sins to be saved, without even thinking about what it means. Without even backing it up with scriptural evidence. They'll go, go turn to Mark 1 like we did and say, well, see, Jesus said you have to repent. Where does it say sins? If sins inherit the definition, why did God repent? God's not a sinner. We need to make sure that we're, using, we're understanding the words, first of all, properly, and that we're using them properly because words have a lot of meaning. And I think a lot of people are mixed up on salvation and aren't even saved as a result of this being like that, of, of people using these words and, and propagating the, the, the false doctrines. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, we're going to see another example of a word that's changed meaning. And here's a word that, I'm, that I tried, I, I don't think I really use it very often in, in the incorrect way, but just recently in our society has changed its meaning, the word gay. Now the word gay was, used to be a, a relatively common word in the English language. I've been reading stories uh, unto, my, unto my girls, we've got these little books that they like to read and they were written, they're a little bit older. So they're using some of the language in English that was old and from time to time you'll see the word gay in there. Now it's a shame that the, the true meaning of that word has just gotten forgotten on the queers and the perverts and the sodomite and the filthy reprobates to describe them because the word gay is actually a good word. It's just talking about, you know, happy, joyful, gay. That used to be no problem saying it. Now it's like you don't even want to say that word. And now even when I'm reading the book, I don't want the kids to have the wrong impression about what I'm talking about just because the word gay is used so prevalently incorrectly and that the definition is being changed. Gay does not mean homosexual. Gay does not mean queer, sodomite, faggot. Those words are all appropriate for describing the pedophile, for describing the person who's attracted to their own gender and, and does wicked things behind closed doors or out in public or wherever they do these things because they're just filthy animals. But gay is not proper. We should not, we should not be caught up with the world in changing what this word means. And I refuse to use that word in a description of a pervert. It's a Bible word. And the Bible says that all the, word, all the words of the Lord are pure words. Look at James chapter 2, verse number 2. The Bible says, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. He's not talking about someone who comes in looking like a flaming faggot and calling that gay clothing. No, he's talking about having goodly apparel, right? Someone comes in and they're dressed real nice. Maybe someone who's got a nice fancy suit and a you know, nice tie and it's just they're looking really nice and they have goodly apparel on. The Bible's referring to that as being gay clothing, good clothing, right? And you have respect to that person over a homeless person maybe that comes in and has tattered clothes. That's what he's teaching against, but the word gay there has nothing to do with what the society is changing it into today. Turn if you would to Deuteronomy 32. I know we're going back and forth here to the extremes on the, the beginning and end of the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 32, I want you to see this. And again, most of these, I, all of these probably, most of these, not all these, I preach entire sermons about. But we're going to get them all here in one quick shot on what the, uh, how the, the meanings have been changing. Deuteronomy 32, look at verse number 31. Bible reads, for their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. 
Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. The word wine is another word that has changed its meaning slightly. Now, again, all, you'll notice all of these words, except for gay. Like, gay is just a totally different definition, just completely removed from what it, from what it used to mean. And I think the only reason that it ever became used is because you'd have the, just the total flaming fairies that they would put up as, as comic relief on sitcoms, like a way back in the day, like, you know, when I was growing up, if there was ever a homo character, it would always be this real flamboyant, oh, and everyone would just laugh at it because it was just kind of a mockery and just, oh, what a, what a, what a silly little faggot, right, and just laugh at him. And I think that's where the gay came from, is that because they, they would always portray them as just always being really happy and giddy and, and whatever. And I think that's where the term ever even became applied to, to the pervert. But the word wine and these other ones, you're going to see subtle changes, right? The word wine today, if, you, if you're just in normal conversation with somebody and you, and you just use the word wine, what's the thought? I'm automatically, you're thinking an alcoholic beverage, right? Red wine or white wine? What are you talking about? Right? Relatively high alcoholic content beverage, and that's the first thing that pops into your mind. And that's what most people think, and that's why there's, there's people that get deceived, thinking that, oh, it's okay to drink wine because Jesus turned water into wine, and that's just fine, and he, he gave it to a bunch of people at a party that were already well drunk. But see, in the Bible, the word wine has two meanings. It's actually one meaning. It's, it's, it's literally just the, the juice that comes from vine, or from a fruit, even just more broadly. It may or may not have alcoholic content in it. It may or may not have been fermented. It's literally just a drink that has come from the source of a fruit, and, it's become, and that's a beverage, and that's the way wine is used. However, I believe it's very easy to tell which type of wine the Bible is referring to. And you can look back. I have sources. If you're interested in seeing these sources, see me after the service and I'll get them for you. Where that show from history in English, the word wine being used for non-alcoholic beverages. That is the way the word was used. And people want to turn their ear from, from seeing this because there's certain people that want to cling so strongly to wine being acceptable to drink, that drinking wine is not a sin, that they don't want to even look at the evidence. Look, in English, 400 years ago, people used the word wine for non-alcoholic beverages, and that was completely normal because that's the way that it was used. That's the way that it was used when it was translated here in the Bible. And the way that we understand which one it's talking about is the context. If it's a negative... Because you'll go from one extreme to the other. In Deuteronomy 32, what do you say? Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. That's a pretty damning <laughs> explanation of, of, of a wine. That's a, that's a pretty negative connotation associated with wine. Saying you're drinking the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of, of asps, of snakes. He's saying that's, that's, that's snake venom that you're drinking right now. That wine. Making a distinction between their wine and our wine. Because when you see wine in other places in the Bible, you're going to see very positive. It's a blessing of God. It's a, it's a good thing. It's a positive thing to have wine. Jesus turned water into wine. Why? Because in one instance it's alcoholic, in the other instance it's not. I mean, in Deuteronomy 32, it's talking about their vine is the vine of Sodom in the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. That is the negative connotation. That is talking about an alcoholic beverage. But in Isaiah 65, verse 8, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servants' sakes, that I may not destroy them all. So there we see the new wine found in the cluster, unfermented. But it's referring to wine being in the cluster because the juice is still in the cluster of grapes. 
And the wine literally is still there. It hasn't been pressed out of the grape yet, but the wine exists in the grape. And he says that there's a blessing in that. It's a good thing. It's a blessing of God to be able to drink a nice glass of juice. So that's why I'm not going to get too far in depth in that because I preach entire sermons about these. Uh, turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. We see another word, and that word is let. The word let, there's a, there's a usage of the word let in the Bible that we don't really use anymore today. We pretty much use the word let as in allow. My kids say, Mommy, will you let me go outside and play? Will you allow me to go outside, right? Will you let me do this? Will you let me do that? And honestly, that, that word is the most common usage in the Bible also. You know, um, using that, that word of let. But there's another definition of the word let that we have to get from the context, which actually means the opposite. Let's look at uh, Romans 1 verse 13. It says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. And the word let in this usage just means he was prevented from. He was not allowed. So basically what he's saying is like, I don't want you to be ignorant. I, don't want, I want you to understand this, that many times, oftentimes, it was my desire to come unto you. I purpose to come unto you. It was my plan to come and visit you. But I was let hitherto. So up to this point, I was prevented from visiting you. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, talking about the Antichrist, that we'll see that word used again. Now in verse 3, it says, let no man deceive you by any means. So there we see the usage of the word, let no man deceive you. He's saying, don't allow any man to deceive you. Right? That's the more common usage, the, the, the usage that we understand of the word let. So for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Clearly stating that the day of Christ, don't worry about when that's coming. I mean, you realize that it is coming soon, but he says it's not going to happen. Don't let anyone deceive you that it's, that it's at hand. It's going to happen at any moment because the man of sin needs to be revealed first, the son of perdition. The Antichrist needs to be exposed and needs to, to come to light before that day could even happen. And then in verse 6 it says, And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And there is another usage of that word let. We're saying basically it's he that's preventing something from happening. He that letteth it says he will let. He will, he, he will continue to withhold until he's removed out of the way. And I'm not going to go into all of what that means. A lot of people think that's talking about the Holy Ghost. That's false. That's not talking about the Holy Ghost. But um, that's a sermon for another day. Turn if you go to James chapter 4. Because will, the word will is another word that's kind of changed meaning a little bit. We're, our common usage today, we think of the word will like if I say, I will, I, I, I will go to the store for you. We use the word will more like the word shall. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 13 says, Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So instead of saying, We will go into such a city, you know, on tomorrow, next year, we have all these plans, we're going to do this. The word will, and, and here's a real easy way to remember this. Just think of somebody's last will, right? Your will. That, that's, that is the way that the word will is used in the Bible, I think, every time. Just, it's, it's what you want. It's what you wish. It's what you are, want to do. It's not necessarily, you know, sh we shall do this just means you are going to do it. But will is what you want to do. So the Bible talks about your wills and the spirit being willing but the flesh being weak. 
So your spirit wants to do the good things, but your flesh oftentimes will prevent you from doing the good things. You never end up doing the good things because your flesh takes you off and doing into, into sinful things. That word will, and that's what it says, if the Lord will, if the Lord wants it, if it's the Lord's will, we shall live, you know, till another year, till 10 years or whatever, and do these things. And that's what James 4 is talking about there. So it's that word will, another word to keep in mind. Uh, one more word here, conversation. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. G Galatians chapter 1. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 1. I want you to see this. Galatians chapter 1. When we see the word conversation, we, very, we today think just of having a, conver of a conversation with somebody, right? Speaking, communicating that way. But the word conversation in the Bible actually is much, has a much broader meaning than just having like a speaking conversation with somebody. So we use the word conversation, you just automatically assume it's, hey, Brother Sebastian and I are going to go over here, we're going to have a conversation, we're just going to talk about something. Galatians 1.13 gives a very good understanding of what conversation really means, the, full, the, full, the fullness of the definition. It says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. So what the conversation, what conversation really means in the Bible, in the biblical sense, the way it used to be used, is more encompassing of your entire way of life. The way that you went about doing things. So he says, you have heard of my conversation in times past, the way I used to do things. And then he explains what that was, what that conversation was in times past, how that I persecuted the church of God. His persecution of the church was not verbal. It was not just him talking with another person and deriding the church of God. No, his persecution was going out, hailing men and women, and sending them to prison. That's what he was doing in his persecution. He was literally going after them and doing something. And, and he was all about that. I mean, he was all about going after the church of God because he ignorantly believed his religion. He just ignorantly was following it and he was zealous toward his religion. He thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was doing God's service. He thought he was doing everything right. And his conversation, his, his whole manner of being and what he did was at going after the church of God. He was dedicated to it. That's his conversation. Now, when we look at these, these, you know, there's a lot of scripture that uses the word conversation. How it says when Lot was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. It's not incorrect to, to, to apply that verse to say that, you know, the, the, the communications they were having between themselves vexed Lot. But that is far from the only thing that that word conversation means. Because it's, it's everything about how you're doing things, right? It's the, it's the way that they live their lives, all the things that they're doing, including the things that they talked about, would all be part of your conversation. In 1 Timothy 4.12, the Bible says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So there it lists those two things separate, right? In word, the things that you speak, and in your conversation. So just keep that in mind. You know, it's something interesting because oftentimes it's very easy to read the, the verse and say, oh, conversation, and just automatically just uh, understand it to mean a, converse, a verbal conversation between people as opposed to more than that, much broader of, of the actual whole way that they live their lives. All right, we're almost done here. I got a few more points to make. Another word that's changed meaning, but this this is kind of changed meaning more through bad. It's not necessarily the meaning of the word. I just wanted to bring this up because it, it sort of fits in with all the other words that we're talking about here. Is the word paradise, and this one has changed its meaning based on just bad doctrine and people teaching a false doctrine. It, it, goes, it, it's, it basically is linked with that doctrine of Abraham's bosom where they look at Luke 16 and they say that, uh, you know, paradise used to exist in hell. So when, it, when the Bible says that Jesus went to hell for three days and three nights, it's not talking about the fiery, literal burning hell. It's talking about paradise 
that was next to hell, but it was, it was in the center of the earth, so that's why it's called hell. And, you know, and they go through all these weird, long explanations, which are just garbage, which is just bad um, doctrine being taught and changing what paradise really is. And from all evidence in the Bible, I'm going to read you all, because paradise is only mentioned three times in the Bible. The word paradise is used three times. Never once are you going to ever get the understanding that it's actually in hell. And here's a quote from Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler said, Through clever and constant application of propaganda, and don't tell me there's not propaganda going on in churches across America today. There's lots of propaganda being, being taught across the pulpit. Yep. People can be made to see paradise as hell. Through lots of propaganda, if you're told enough times, we just keep on bringing it up and hammering it home, you could think that paradise is hell. But where's the evidence for it? Luke 12, let's read these for you. Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And this is where the whole doctrine comes from, because Jesus was on the cross, right? And he was speaking to the thief, and he said, you know, when the thief said, you know, hey, remember me when thou comest in that kingdom, he says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. But we know that Jesus spent three days and three nights in hell. Right? In the heart of the earth. You say, oh, well, if he's going to be with me in paradise, then I guess paradise is in hell. No. Jesus spake that as God in the flesh. The Bible says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Jesus is one with the Father. So if the thief is in heaven with God, he's there with Jesus, even though Jesus went to hell for three days and three nights. I mean, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around that, but that is the only consistent thing, as opposed to saying, well, paradise is actually in hell. We'll, we'll look at the other mentions of paradise. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2 says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. What's the direction? Up or down? Up. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. So there's another mention of the word paradise where the direction given is up, not down, up. People say, oh yeah, but after Jesus resurrected from the dead, then paradise was relocated from the center of the earth up to heaven. Really? Chapter and verse, please, that tells me that. Oh, this is the chapter and verse that they'll turn to to tell you that. And they'll turn to Luke 23. Well, see, if, if Jesus was with the man, uh, the thief on the cross, and, and Jesus went to hell, then that's where, that's where paradise was. And now all of a sudden, well, it must have moved because now paradise is up. And then Revelation 2.7 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now you can look up for yourself all the times tree of life is used. You're going to find it used in the Garden of Eden. And you're going to find it in heaven. Before the throne of God. When the water of life is flowing out from the throne of God. And in the midst of, the, of, that, of that water of life is going to be the tree of life. which you also find the reference. You never, n never find the tree of life, paradise of God ever being in hell. Never. It's, it's, a, it's faulty logic that will bring that definition up. It's not biblical uh, usage of the word or um, going to the Bible to define the words. Now, as our words are important, it's important to understand the meaning and how words change meaning. It's also important that we be very clear with our words. Understanding the fact that these words change meanings, we want to be very careful when using these words with other people, with other believers or other potential believers, right? All those words I mentioned, you want to be very careful in the way that you use them. Because you need to make sure that what you're saying and what they're understanding is the same thing. Now, we have a lot of people that use these spiritual phrases these days that are not found in Scripture at all. You know, normally we ask people, how do you know that you're saved? They might say all kinds of different things. 
You know, some common ones were, well, I asked Jesus into my heart. You know what? The Bible never says you have to ask Jesus into your heart in order to be saved. The Bible says you call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Yes. But, you know, these are things that are, have become real popular. I gave my life to Christ. Now, that one just, just flat out wrong. Someone says, you know, I asked Jesus into my heart. You could, that's another, you know, roundabout way of saying you believed on him. It could be. Doesn't necessarily mean that that's what, they, that's what they're saying. But it's a lot closer to that than I gave my life to Christ. People say, I gave my life. Well, that sounds like you're doing the work. That sounds like you're the one who's changing your life. You're the one that is submitting to the law of God for your salvation instead of accepting that Christ gave his life for you. And then another common one, of course, is why well, I repented of my sins. Right? All of these things. Are, are phrases that people throw out there. Now, oftentimes people will throw these phrases out there because they hear it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again from the pulpit, and they don't think about them, and they just use them and they repeat them. Doesn't mean they honestly believe that in their heart. All the more reason, though, when you, when you hear these phrases and hear these words, really try to dig in, well, what do you mean by that? What, you know, get to definition of terms. What exactly does that mean? To get the full understanding. Instead of just saying, oh, okay, well, they asked Christ in their heart, so they're saved. No, don't stop there. Get the full understanding. And we ought to avoid all of those phrases altogether and use scriptural language. That's why we're always, when we talk to people, we really stress being a believer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because that is what the Bible says over and over and over again is required for salvation is that belief, the faith. And when you, even if you're giving examples, sometimes I'll give an example and say, well, if I were confronted by God and God were to ask me, why I should be allowed into heaven, I would say because I believe on Jesus Christ. And those are very, very, very scriptural words to use. And we want to stick with that and stick as close as you can so that way there can be not nearly as much confusion about what you believe. And being aware of the fact that the word repent has kind of undergone changes in the way that people understand it, always question that. So if someone uses the word repent, just say, hey, well, what do you mean by that? And if they don't really know what they mean and they're not, they're not, you know, give you a good example, just, just start, just lay it out and be like, well, look at what the Bible says here, you know, give them some solid examples and ask them, well, what do you really believe by that? Now, there are a couple words that we do use that are not found in the Bible. I'm a big fan of just using scriptural words as much as possible. But there are certain words like trinity or rapture, for example, that are not found one time in the Bible. But the meaning is very, very, very clear and very common and not incorrect at all. When people understand trinity, they know you're talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost being one. There's nothing wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong with using that. Because it's very common usage and, and people will understand exactly what you're saying when you say it. And the whole point is to be able to communicate with people and just get them to understand you and to be able to, to teach and to preach God's word effectively. So when you use a word like rapture or trinity, okay, they're not using the Bible, but you know what? There isn't really a biblical term for that concept. The closest thing that you could find to trinity would be three in one. These three are one. But that's, now all of a sudden you use a lot more words to explain the same exact concept that you could do in one word. Or rapture, you know, being caught up together with him in the air. Right? The, the catching up. People understand the word rapture. Now you might be listening and saying, well, I'm not very good at communicating with people. You need to work at that then. If you're someone that's not good at explaining things, Take this to heart. You need to get better at that because it's all of our responsibility to give the gospel to people. We all need to be able to open up the scripture and explain how someone can be saved and you need to get better at expressing ideas and communicating unto other people what this is really talking about. You need to work at that. And focus, if, you're, if you're not good at it, focus on one thing at a time and spend the time to think, how can I explain this? So you don't just have to come up with it on the fly if you're not very good at it. Some people are gifted and able to, to come up with, with expressing themselves 
and saying things in a way where they don't have to premeditate about it and think about it and, and, and really have it ready to go before they go and speak to someone. They're really good at just thinking on the fly and just coming up with the, you know, analogies. Other people aren't like that. And if you're not like that, then take the time beforehand, on, at least on the core doctrines of the things that you believe, to be able to explain it to other people, to be prepared to do that. The point is to be easily understood. We use this scripture in this morning's sermon, 2 Corinthians 3.12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Our speech needs to be very plain and easily understood so that people could just literally get what we're talking about. In Habakkuk 2.2, the Bible says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, for he had given Habakkuk a vision, and make it plain upon the tables, that he may run that readeth it. He's saying, make it easy for people to, to understand it. God doesn't want us all confused. Well, what does this really mean? He wants it to be made plain. That's, that's one of the reasons why he's given the, the office of a bishop is to be able to make God's word plain and easily understood by people. Because ultimately it's not that difficult, but sometimes we could just think it's confusing and we need someone to help us to understand it a little bit better, just to break it down and to make it very plain and easily understood. Now the last point I want to make, I've got a list here, because I don't want you to be fooled. As much as we do want things to be made plain, easily understood, make it simple, make, you know, break things down, that's the argument that the people who believe in these false versions, the perversions of the Bible, will try to give you as to why you should read the NIV, for example, or read the New American Standard. Read, you know, read, because the King James Bible is just too difficult to understand. They use too many archaic words. Like, like you're preaching a whole sermon about it. All these words have changed meaning. That's why you need a new Bible. That's why you need a new translation. Because these words have changed meaning. And I say no, and don't get caught up in that false belief because, first of all, it's not even true. It's not true at all. You look at all these versions that they come out with, they are not easier to understand. There's, they'll, they'll be able to point to certain places and say, see, look, who knows what this word is in the King James Bible, but we've replaced it with this because it's easier. Well, I have a list here, and I'm not going to read there, There's tons of words on here. And remember, and I, I only use the NIV. But the NIV is supposed to be easier to read, right? Easier to understand. Getting rid of those archaic words and just words that the common man today could understand. Well, let's look at some of these and let's see what's easier. Because I've got the references of all the places where it's got the King James and the NIV and just the word that was used in that translation. Just so that you can see that it's not, their, their goal is not to make it easier to understand. Their goal is just perverting the, the Word of God. And they're selling it to you as being easier to understand. If it were truly easier to understand, then why do we have all these words? Look at, like, for example, armlets. The NIV uses the word armlets in Numbers 3150, and the KJV uses the word chains. What's easier to understand, armlets or chains? I think chains is easier to understand. Or the, the NIV uses the word blunted. Whereas the KJV uses cut in pieces. The NIV uses the word brood. The KJV uses the word children. Again, which one's easy? what's the easier word to understand there? A brood or your children? How many people are going to understand what the word brood means? Now, maybe everyone here understands. I mean, I know what that word means, but children is a much easier word. Now, I'll make this point right now. There are times where the KJV word is more difficult to understand than NIV. But see, the KJV isn't the one, you know, the people who promote it isn't saying that, oh, the whole point of this is to make it easier to read. No, it's the word of God. It is what it is. And, and the, the words were translated appropriately. Whereas the NIV is the one who does claim, well, this is easier to read. We don't use these, these old words and these weird words. We use common words like colonnade. C-O-L-O-N-N-A-D-E. Anyone know what a colonnade is here? Because I didn't know what a colonnade was. And I feel like I have a, a decent vocabulary. KJV used the word porch. I know what a porch is. Don't know what a colonnade is. Don't even know if it is a porch, to be honest with you. 
But that's the word that they used. Cores, C-O-R-S. KJV used the word measures. Or denarius. KJV uses penny. Real easy to understand, right? We've got, I, I've got, I'm not even going to go through all these. In crouch versus enter, exasperate versus provoke, factions versus parts, figurehead versus sign, gadfly versus destruction, goyim versus nations. And there they're just using the, the Hebrew word, right? They just want to not translate the Hebrew word of goyim. Where it just means nations or Hades. You talk to people about Hades. How about hell? Because anybody uses the word Hades, it's hell. People know what hell means. Jowls or cheeks, right? Nephilim. NFV uses the word Nephilim. Oh, the Nephilim. And people want to say how, how mysterious the Nephilim are and how, much, how, how smart I am because I know about the Nephilim. And the Nephilim are these. These big creatures that were hybrids with the angels and humans, and it, they're giants. Big people, giant people. They were really tall. It's not Nephilim. Awful. O F F A L. Awful. awful. KJV uses the word dung. I know what the word dung means. Pinions. KJV uses the word wings. Portico. Portico. Sounds Spanish, right? <laughs> Can I have a side of Portico with my taco? Portico. KJV uses the word porch. Again. I, I, it's almost like they're going to a thesaurus to just use different words to get their copyright status because they have to change it enough in order for it to be a different version. Oh, wait, but no, they're trying to make it easier to understand because people know what the word Portico means. It's really a lot easier to understand the Bible when you're reading NIV, isn't it? Qualm or fear. Oh, satraps. You know, because everyone knows what a satrap is, too. A satrap. Of course, we use that every day. It's common language. A satrap. My cousin went into the army. He's a satrap. Or he's a lieutenant. Terebinth. Who knows what a terebinth tree is? It's an elm. It's an elm. Or they use the word promiscuity as opposed to whoredoms. And you know, just lightening up. You know, you might know what promiscuity means. Oh, they're just a little promiscuous. It's a nice way of saying you're a whore. Tresses versus galleries. Vassal versus a servant. Verdant versus green. Or wadi. Wadi. You want to go down to the wadi and pan for gold? So it means river. Wadi. Yeah. So those are all NIV words versus King James words. Now, you could find lists that would be somewhat similar. I don't think quite the same because the words they're using in the KJV, I, I've seen what people try to bring up. There are a few words that you may not have any idea what they mean but you can pull up a dictionary and find out exactly what they mean. It's not very difficult. I think there's a lot less of that in the KJV than there is in the NIV. But if you're going to even make the claim, and I'm not going to say all the words in the KJV are easy to understand. I don't make that claim. But I'm not also not claiming that the whole intent of this is to make it so that, the, so that so it's just easily understood and read by everybody versus the NIV, you know, the, the proponents of that will say, don't read that old KJV. It's too hard to understand. Get yourself this book because it's way easier. No, it's not. And if it's easier for you to understand, it's because it's, it's man's word and not God's word and maybe you're not saved. Because the, the things of God, you know, Jesus Christ said that, that my sheep hear my voice. We could hear him. This is the voice of Christ in these words. We ought to be able to hear this. And if you just can't understand anything in this book, you ought to check your salvation. And I mean that, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that like in a denigrating way or, or anything like that. It's, it's, it's honest that maybe if you really have a hard time understanding the Word of God in the King James Bible, you know, you ought to just 
check what you believe about being saved. And make sure you've accepted the free gift because it's not difficult to understand. I know there's some sections that may be a little bit hard or confusing to you, but by and large, I mean, you ought to be able to read through this book and, and walk away with some understanding of what you're reading if you're saved. The words we use are important. We need to make sure that we're clear and clearly defining words and making sure, especially when we talk about the Bible with other people, that it's very easily understood what is meant by the words that we use. And just be aware of these words that, that might be more confusing, that might have different definitions, that people might be thinking something different about than what you actually mean when you use them. Let's bow our heads and a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for preserving these words for us today, dear Lord. It's really not that difficult to understand. God, if we do have a hard time understanding and we are saved, dear Lord, help us just to get smarter. Help us to be able to, to increase our vocabulary and to learn a little bit more. That we don't have to rely on dumbing down your word in order to understand it, but that we can just maybe try to raise ourselves up to the level that we need to be at in order to be a uh, more profitable servant for you, dear Lord, that we could fully understand what you're trying to communicate unto us. Help us with our speech to be able to communicate everything um, as well as possible to make things easily understood, especially to those that are lost, dear Lord, that we can make the gospel easily understood, that people can, can get a proper understanding and get saved, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.